let me just give you a quick take on this. Uh, I won't bore you enough. So a quick take on my, my mural, which was uh, commissioned by Hacken. So uh, it has a lot to do with the Web3 world and the blockchain world, which is a bit alien for me because I'm an artist, that kind of thing. Um, so I wanted to, to, to have an art, art piece that would re reflect, literally and not literally, um, safety and transparency. So I used um, the, the, the mirror and the 3D to, 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 to show that option. Um, so usually when you look in the mirror, you trust what you see, you trust yourself, it's familiar. So um, I wanted to use that. And then I've been recently for the last maybe two years, been working more on 3D things in my murals because I paint a lot of murals here in Lisbon. Um, and also a reference to blockchain. I wanted to make something fun that wasn't like, had blockchain right, right on the mural, like very brand, brand orientated. I wanted to make something abstract. So I created the, the, the cubes that are little blocks that float around the, the pool. Uh, also, the, the Hacken's, cur curiously enough, the Hacken's uh, color is this turquoise. And we also kind of find that turquoise is also the color of the pools, on the bottom of the pool. So it was like two in one um, thing that was kind of a happy coincidence. And then also the, the graphic patterns, which I, I do a lot in my work because I'm, I was born in South Africa, so I use a lot of African patterns to, to inspire my work. And I have a graphic design background as well. So inspired by the, um, the flow and the, the chaos and the everything coming together in a very harmonious way. Uh, I used, um, in this case, I used a lot of more uh, organic lines to reflect the, again, reflect the, um, the reflections of the, the patterns that when we're looking at a swimming pool, the water makes like these little like these lines like this. So it's kind of like looking at a swimming pool. Um, and then, yeah, I have like references to uh, the number three in, in the design, Web3. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, that's more or less the idea behind this. They say that explanation kills art, but hopefully this will survive. <laughs> so, so just interpret the way, the way you feel and the way that this mural talks to you. And yeah, feel free to take photos and tag me. <laughs> so, so yeah, thank you so much. Welcome to Green Morning Sleeper. I'm Irina once again, and I welcome you at Poolside. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> Who has been uh, to Creative Morning events already? I'm so curious to find out. Okay, many people. Woohoo! Great. Let me remind you what Creative Mornings is. It was founded in uh, 2008 by Tina Roth Eisenberg in uh, New York, Brooklyn, out of a desire to bring some um, outgoing and um, free of charge events for the creative uh, community of Brooklyn. The idea was very simple. Uh, a coffee break or a light breakfast and an inspiring talk. And it, as you can see, we got popular and now we exist in uh, 223 cities all over the world. All this is possible only thanks to our sponsors and partners. Thank you MailChimp, our global uh, sponsor for marketing. Thank you Poolside, a Web3 hub located here in Alvalad. Um, this is one uh, of the first uh, space is opened here in this Web3 district and um, uh, I am very, very happy that uh, we were invited by Poolside here and um, we also uh, would like to say thank you to Talent Protocol and we have the um, founder of Talent Protocol here, Pedro, and I would like to invite him here to introduce uh, the project and to tell us a bit more about Talent Protocol and Poolside as well because you we are partners. Thank you, Irina, and congrats on setting this up. Big round of applause for Irina, please. Uh, yeah, I'll start with Poolside just a little bit. So they've been massive partners of, of Talent Protocol and every like started building in Web3 in, in Lisbon. So it's kind of like um, informally, it's almost like there's a Web3 district uh, popping up in Alvalade. Which is like why a lot? I don't know. But uh, I guess this space, Poolside, was the the first comer, 
and they they took this place actually this room I was telling the story just uh, a little bit before coming on stage so this room was actually a, a wave making pool so this was supposed to be a restaurant uh, but their opening date was set for March 20. <laughs> Oops. So you can imagine what happened. Uh, so this pool was turned into an amazing uh, conference space. There's also a co-working space, which I think it's open for the crew afterwards. Like you guys can use them. Uh, we can use CV Labs. It's another. CV Labs. Uh, yeah, it's another uh, okay. hub here located on the same street. It's like 30 meters. Yes, yeah, uh, 30 walking. meters. Like, yes. Uh, meters, not mint. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is. As I said, part of the Web3 district. So full site started, and then CV Labs. There's more um, entities coming over, and Talent Protocol is is one of them. So we like I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit. So I'm in that moment. I'm in between uh, you and Alex. So I'll try to keep it short. Um, so look, we're in a mission to help the next generation of builders achieve success and fulfillment, and we're we're trying to do that by kind of like. Uh, almost like if LinkedIn and Patreon had a kid together, but in a Web3 way, if that makes any sense. Um, so we're trying to support talent financially, emotionally, and socially. So we have uh, three ways that people can do that. So you can set up your profile on talentprotocol.com. It's beautiful, modular, interoperable, and it's your own data, by the way. Um, and then people can um, subscribe to your work. They can subscribe to your career updates. They can stake on you. Staking is um, a new thing in Web3's uh, financial mechanism. It's different from um, saving pools. It's almost like supporting someone for locking in assets in something. So if you stake on someone, you're locking in financial assets on that person. Um, and that is a form of belief capital. So it's all, almost like making a financial endorsement on someone. Um, so we can also stake on someone. And when you do that, not only you get financial recompensation, but also you have access to that person's perks. All right. So it, this depends from person to person. We have some creators, some artists that give their own perks. I've claimed a few uh, myself. And the less um, no, the less support model is our sponsor model. It's so the more the purest form of support of raw talent. So you're supporting someone's career goals. We've done this so far. Think about it like a soft validation of product. Um, we've done it with our Talent House program, which is a scholarship program to bring talent from all over the world to their first Web3 hackathon or conference. We actually, we did one in IF Rio last week. We're doing the next one in Lisbon and then Paris. And then Kiwiji in um, uh, Kenya. I, I, I butchered the name, but uh, not the, the country name, the, the city name. Um, and then uh, Seoul in, in Korea. So we are already kind of doing that through a program, and now we're productizing that to the platform using a smart contract. So you can sponsor someone's career goals, like be a patron, and support that person. All of this on chain, and that, that's why it's like LinkedIn and Patreon together, but in a Web3 way. So that's it, and now I guess you're coming back? Yeah, or is it, coming through? Yeah, I just wanted to double check. What is the nice? Because it's another incredible uh, the nice, did uh, you move forward? Yeah, man of many hats. Um, <laughs> So one hat, other hat I have, I'm a member at d Nights. Um, d Nights was something that we started like, I don't know, one year ago, kind of, one year and a half ago. And it was basically, we were looking at uh, the, the Portuguese ecosystem and it was very scattered, like the Web3 startups, whether it was uh, 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 created by locals or not, was very scattered, like no one was talking to, to one another. But at the same time, Lisbon was this hotspot for Web3. Like, uh, especially around Web Summit, maybe you don't realize it, but there's like a, a massive Web3 uh, wave of events around that time. Not only tech, the Web3 in specific too. So we, we got together, we thought, oh, why, why don't we join forces, all of us, all of these startups, uh, around the, the country and what well, regardless if it's built by nationals or not and we just create this sort of decentralized event so we did it, the first one we were part of many of them uh, it was such a massive success so we called it D nights decentralized night and um, it was such a massive success that it eventually turned into a DAO 
So DAO means decentralized autonomous organization. It's too early in the morning for me to <laughs> what a DAO is. Um, but you know, if you want to look it up, it's actually cool. It's almost like a collective but on chain with smart contract governance. So actually collective done right ish with no corruption ish. Um, we we built D Nights DAO. We raised um, over 100k in funds. And uh, the DAO has been supporting um, events that promote uh, Web3, um, not only in Portugal, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's essentially the United States, a side project, uh, not for profit, uh, that we, we are doing. Yeah. When is the next event? So the night, um, next event is going to be on the, as far as I know, on the 9th of June. Mm -hmm. All right. That's which yeah. with why, why the ninth of June? So that that week from the fifth to the ninth of June is unofficially going to be like a blockchain week in Lisbon. So there's going to be non fungible conference. So NFTs people they're going to be all over that place. There's Epic Web Tree going on as well, which is another event. There's going to be a bunch of other events. Uh, Talent Protocol is organizing a builders week. So we have partnered up with multiple cohorts, Poolside. CV Labs, uh, three more co-works, uh, one per day, and um, also with 10 or more workshops, and like a prototype competition uh, with the Finalissima on the knife. And after the competition and the awards are given, we have a D Nights with a special twist. It's gonna be a D Nights um, like Santos. Who knows what Santos is? Santos plus, no? Right. Um, how do we explain the sandwich? Uh, it's the Lisbon uh, parties, I don't know, outside in the street, everybody's having fun, uh, I don't know, it's uh, sardines. And, uh, so it's going to be a, a sandwich tea night, so outside with this, this Portuguese uh, yeah. twist, Lisbon twist. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. So if you are here in June, and hopefully we're all here, it's <coughs> the perfect time to be in Lisbon, to enjoy Santos. So let's uh, let's go to the nights all together, okay? Yeah. Yeah. I will just uh, continue with the other partners and sponsors that we have. I want to thank uh, Civil Labs and Cube co-working. We can co-work there afterwards. Uh, just come up to me. I will give you all the details. So it's it's just located nearby another battery. Hub is um, the heartbeat of Crypto Valley. Who knows where is Crypto Valley located? <laughs> where the Crypto Valley is located? <laughs> it's Switzerland. Okay, but um, yeah, so it's good to go there and to double check. Um, then I would like to say big thank you to Daily Coffee, the official um, representative of Lavazza Coffee here in Portugal. The amazing coffee that we just had at our breakfast. And the uh, 351 startup community in Major Lisboa for their media support. And of course, uh, Creative Mornings Lisbon team. We have here photographers, videographers, creative writers, um, connectors, and uh, community builders uh, that work very hard every month to bring up all these uh, events. So let's say thank you to our volunteers that are present here today. Theodora has already presented her incredible art piece. And um, I want to say that every month, all 223 chapters get connected together by one global theme. This month's theme is movement. What is movement for you? So it's a, a universal state of being, right? When we move all together, we can build incredible and powerful social movements. We can move things forward. And today we invited Alex, who is moving um, the, um, the whole, okay, the, the museum industry, I don't know how to call it, the whole museum ecosystem moving forward. And um, we want to be part of this movement. So Alex, please come here and tell us a bit more about your project. Good morning, everyone. This is uh, slightly do I have a clicker or uh, <laughs> slightly too early for me? Um, I'm Alexander. I'm the co-founder of Archive, and we are building a museum together. So bringing a global community of people together to build a museum. And as I global, that means we're all around the world, and half my team is in San Francisco. So normally my rhythm goes to 
1, 2 a.m., meaning I'm typically not up talking at this point of, uh, point of time. But today I am, and I'm excited to be here at, uh, at Creative Mornings. Um, when I, I did another talk very recently at Crypto Mondays, also invited by Arena, and it was very different. It was very focused on the decentralization, the web three of everything. As Arena invited me to this talk and said, can you please do it again, only differently? Um, and uh, she asked me to do a little bit of my backstory as well, which is why I call this talk Individual Movement to Collective Movement. Uh, and I took it very literally. Uh, I literally went all the way back. Um, <laughs> Because when I grew up, I grew up in an art gallery. My dad was an architect, my mom had an art gallery. Um, so art was a big part of me growing up, uh, from traveling around the world, seeing and experiencing art. Um, but I didn't really uh, touch on it until much later in life. Um, because for me, I was fascinated by all the options of the world. I lived in the UK when I was very young. I studied economics for a while, studied architecture, until I went into computer science. Um, and what I ended up translating all this into eventually was becoming a builder. And I think that's where my journey really started. Um, I'm a startup founder, I've been building companies for the last 10 years or so. I uh, started out in Aarhus, Denmark, where I'm from. Um, so up in a much, much darker place, which I tried to resemble this little piece of, piece of graphic here. Um, part of the reason I'm living here is to avoid exactly that. It's, I get slightly depressed in the winter uh, when it's that dark. Um, and that's also probably why I started with my first company, Reflectly, which was a cute little robot back then, this is now eight years ago. Um, we touted it as the worst, uh, world's first intelligent journal. It wasn't very intelligent back then. I think tools are now really catching up with the latest trends in, in AI. But I think it really came from actually feeling the depressions of winter. Um, and again, building, trying to solve my own problems at the time. So the first product we really built was a place for your thoughts, a place for you to think and collect. Um, and that brought me on to the amazing journey of building companies, bringing together teams, being creative together, and, and building together. My tools were code and my computer and design, um, not art, which I think you, those of you are artists here, uh, it's a very different field, but nonetheless, I still found it to be, be creation. Um, the next part of my journey brought me to New York. Um, I started another company called Bounce, which is a luggage storage company. Um, we, me and my co-founder moved to New York at the time and literally rode around on city bikes in the city and signed up locations to build out that. So in this case, we're building a place for your things. Um, and, uh, and again, for me, a big part of my journey was going across the world, meeting people. Um, again, very, very far removed from the art world, but nonetheless still feeling the raw essence of creation, from having an idea to slowly having people use our products all around the world. It brought me further along to San Francisco, um, I lived in San Francisco up until COVID, um, where the US decided to ban everyone who weren't American or green, on a green card from re-entering, which is actually what brought me here. But San Francisco was also an amazing place where um, I think the, they often touted the, uh, what do you call it, the reality distortion field. I think uh, Steve Jobs is often credited for, for, I think that's the very phrase. But what I found fascinating about that place was that people were encouraged to think bigger. Um, it's a very anti the Danish thesis. So I love Denmark. There's so many things I appreciate about Danish culture. But one of the things I always missed was the encouragement to, to think, yeah, to try to do more. And I really found that in San Francisco, where people would encourage you to believe that you could actually change the world. In this case, it wasn't, well, I suppose it was changing. It would make it easier for you to store your bags when you check out on Airbnb. It was exciting, it was challenging, but I was missing that one component. Can I do something that feels more significant than the figure. I left Bounce in 2020. Um, the team actually ended up moving over here, so I don't know if any of you know anyone from the team. They have an amazing team now. Um, started out in Startup Lisbon with a small office. My co-founder, Cody, also set down roots here. Um, and again, build out an amazing team, have an amazing office here now, and they're all around the world, so they're doing really, really well. But it was time for me to move on. Um, and again, I left, started traveling Europe, um, trying to figure out what to do next, then decided I'm not going to build another company unless it feels really significant. And that brought me to Zurich when I met my now co-founder Tom. Both him, he had been on a similar journey. He was building another storage company, coincidentally, called Omni. And they were basically trying to turn all your asset, like all your stuff into assets that you could then rent out on a platform. And he had this grand vision for what you could do with your things. And one of the amazing things he found when people were storing their stuff in the storage company was that people had the most amazing things. Some people were storing rare paintings, uh, first edition Macs, um, 
And, and they had to, because these were very, very valuable items, they built a small vault inside of Omni. And he ended up saying, this is kind of a museum for people's things. So that kind of planted the idea in his mind that what if we could bring people together and build a museum together? And we were sitting there in Zurich, both of us were feeling the same. We didn't want to do anything unless it was really significant. And this felt like it, that we could build a collective museum. Um, this was also touted by Web3. That's not the focus of this talk, and it's actually not typically the focus of my talk when I talk about archive, because to me, Web3 and blockchain is infrastructure. It's like the internet. I think companies in 2000 would call themselves internet companies, but today, you're not an internet company. You use the internet to get your message out and to do what you do. And I feel like we're quickly moving towards that with blockchain and Web3 as well. It enables us to do things that were really hard to do before. It gives us transparency, so it's been, to be a little technical, blockchain is a database that no one can manipulate and it's transparent. So you can see everything in there. That gives us trust and transparency. Um, and in our case, what it enables is bringing thousands of people together to create a museum and trust that is acting on their behalf, that we can incentivize them to participate. And that's our mission. Our mission is to create a collective movement of people, both artists, gallerists, um, from all around the world, uh, and just um, culturally uh, curious to come together and build that this year. We started out a little over a year ago and have been massively accelerating ever since. Have thousands of members right now. Um, really, we've been very restrictive on how many people are inviting to try to control how do you create community on a global scale, slowly opening up for more and more people to come together. And what we do is we have both our community and some of our meaning we, we elect people to come in on a control board to put together acquisition rounds that people then end up voting on. And it's been so fascinating observing people come together and discuss everything from cultural artifacts. One of the ones we acquired was um, Madonna's uh, fans from her vote performance to um, art pieces to pottery. Um, and I find that yeah, the most interesting perspectives come from very, very different people around the world. And then we acquire these. What we do next is we try to place them around the world. We also challenge the notion of what does it mean to be a museum. And I think most of our understanding of museums right now is it's a building in which you go in to view art. But what we were trying to challenge is art should be experienced everywhere. It is everywhere, as we see with the mural out, the beautiful mural that we made for NASA out on the wall. And, and that's what we want to do as well, is all the pieces we acquire, we want to put into the world. We also want this to be a conversation that people participate in as opposed to the British Museum of Art, who have been hoarding the art of the world and putting it in London, we want to say we should put the art in the right place, and that should be a conversation that all of us gets to participate in. So that is the second pillar of what, we, what we're doing. And then lastly, we also want to get to the stage where art should be open to all of us. As some of you always must know, the art industry is, is exciting, fascinating, and very uh, reclusive and opaque at the same time. With, um, people with money controlling um, what happens, who owns art, and where it goes. Um, and that's also been a fascinating, Pandora, a fascinating Pandora's box for us to open and just peel away the layer after layer of ownership in the whole space. Part of our mission is to change that as well and say, all of us coming together should not only decide what art is, but we should own it. Which, in its essence, is true of most museums that are state-owned, so being a citizen country, you are part of owning that art. But we're trying to make it more direct. Your participation becomes directly involved in the curation, the ownership, and the experience of the art itself. Um, and uh, I think I went a little below time here, but uh, I spent quite a bit of time in this presentation to, to try to be a little more artistic and, and create a little bit of a visual story, where my last one was very, very technical and detailed. So instead, I can open up for questions. <coughs> Yes. Hi, hi. Thank you so much, Alexander. I've been following your archive um, initiative very closely because I am I'm coming from the museum world. I am someone asked me what you just said. I'm a museum professional, so I've been working with museums like traditional, with cataloging, storage rooms for 20 years. And last year, I moved into the web free uh, technology space, and I saw that you collect, as you said. Uh, physical objects as well, which is exclusively physical objects. It's right amazing. Yeah. So I'm curious about like the more technical aspect of it. Where are you storing it? Uh, how are you thinking about the whole, you know, collections management and all this kind of more like museum work? 
So um, the answer is that we've been figuring everything out all this as we go. So on our website, we have four pillars, which is vote, propose, acquire, and place. And we started with the voting, uh, acquiring, um, and now we're moving into the act of placements. Um, how do we store them and how do we place them? And the answer really is with our community. So we're obviously love to invite you in. Um, and the way we see it is everyone here welcome to, to join and we want to encourage everyone to, to apply. Um, but we also distinguish, meaning we need to, people with experience. We're not trying to say we want to push existing museums, existing artists and system artists away. We want to work with existing, we're, we're a partnership organization. Um, so if we can help other museums introduce part of our curatorial process and have participation in their museums, we would be delighted. Just as well as we want to learn from someone like you, with your experience, like how and where should we place these. We will challenge you and say, you're not just placing in one building now, you help us place it in places that might be more difficult from a maintenance, insurance, and transportation perspective. Um, but yeah, that's how we do it. So right now, we have um, a little bit of a control board where some people have the experience. Placement is the challenge for the next quarter, um, so it's, it's very relevant right now. Um, and right now, most of the pieces have been in storage, um, but moving one piece up to Calgary Library up in Canada. Another piece is um, uh, on a six-month exhibition in Mexico City. Um, so in this case, these were proposals that came in for the pieces. They were covering costs, they were covering insurance, mm -hmm. and then we're kind of trying out, but figuring out loan agreements and everything on the go. So yeah, mm -hmm. we'd love to extend the invite for you well, to join us. I think you'd love to talk to you. Yes. So uh, I guess on the topic of movement is, uh, I feel like uh, I'm not a music professional at all. Like I have no no understanding of this field. Uh, uh, so I would like to understand how how you envision moving such an uh, entrenched field because uh, it does feel like there's centuries of uh, like habits built on on how you support artists, uh, how you give value to art, and just more on the vision side of how you see you being a cause of movement in that. Yeah. Um, so we were at Art Basel uh, last year, and this was a question that came up very often. So I think when we go into Web3 space, people are like being a little more revolutionary, like challenge it and break it down. Um, we go to Art Basel, it's obviously um, the, the opposite reaction, which is like you're trying to break things down, like you're trying to, because I think there's a ton of expertise built up as well. Well, we can, ch we can challenge um, some sides of the existing art industry, maybe especially the money side, um, there's a lot of expertise, there's a lot of effort that goes into curating, placing, uh, caring, and taking care of the art. Um, so the way we do this is again to partner, meaning we, I don't have the expertise, meaning I'm, I'm a product person, this is I've built multiple products, I have a fascinating appreciation of the art, <coughs> but I'm not going to be the one that makes the decision on how we do those things. That should be people who's already doing it. And for us, it's also working, again, with existing museums. Like, we will loan out our pieces to the museums. We will help them. We actually were approached by multiple museums at Art Basel asking, oh, could you help us run this process with our members? Because most museums have a membership program, and for them, if they could start including those members in some of, these, some of the acquisition decisions, that could maybe help um, improve their otherwise dwindling memberships at this stage. Um, so that's what we see ourselves at. We're kind of reinvigorating the interest and passion of art by saying let's include and expand collaboration. That's enabled by, I think, us like well being more global than it was thanks to COVID, and also the technologies that now makes it easier for us to run these things. But yeah, the answer is to collaborate and work with existing institutions. Yes. Uh, could you give us an example of a piece that went through all four pillars? Um, so the, the process, yeah. yeah, so um, the Alora Casadilla piece. Um, so in this case, it's uh, um, Alora Casadilla, two artists from Puerto Rico um, that got selected by um, our curatorial committee. So some of our rounds have been open call rounds where members are proposing, and that's where we'll eventually move to all our rounds being member-led. But we have to start somewhere. I think we start with doing a little bit on the internal, and then we scale it out until members can take over. In this case, they had a conversation with the artists and selected them um, for a round, and they presented three pieces in a round. They came on a call, presented the pieces to, I think at that point it was like 120 members joined the call, and we had a live conversation with the artist about the pieces, the backstory. Um, one piece was graphed, these flowers spread across uh, the floor for 
of a room to this piece, um, uh, electromagnetic field, which is this canvas with uh, metal fragments on it, and they put currents uh, below, and it's spread across the canvas to create this absolutely beautiful shape. Um, so the community ended up voting for this piece. Over the course of the week, they were discussing the pieces, each one of them, and, and these rooms are typically pretty close. Um, so a few times there's a, a swing piece, but we try to keep them interesting enough that all pieces are merited into the collection. Um, but then people uh, argue and fight for which piece they acquire. <coughs> Once they voted uh, and we decided which one to acquire, we acquired the piece. So go through, we've already taken care of negotiations with the artist up front, so we, we know that once the community made a decision, we can also back it and commit to it. Um, and then, um, I think a few months later, maybe probably four or five months later, we had the piece with us at our parcel, so that was his first kind of exhibition, it was in our booth at our parcel. And then, um, yeah, I think maybe just a month ago, we got a request from, from Calgary Libraries to exhibit this. And in this case, normally, I think in future, what we expect is having cycle for placements. And again, I hope you can help us with figuring out how we manage the logistics of it. Um, so we can take multiple applications so this becomes something we can partner and decide. But initially, we, we need to just figure out what are all the challenges involved. So let's try to place a piece, at least on a temporary thing, to figure out all the intricacies. Got that application and worked with them to make sure that they met the requirements for caretaking of the piece. Uh, has been working through the loan agreement last week or so. and. Um, teeing up everything and then shipping it up there. Uh, and then Tom, my co-founder, will go up and present the opening of the piece. Um, and the answer is, as I said before, we're figuring it out on the go. Um, but in this case, we move through all phases. Um, where, but the last phase is placement and involving the community widely in placements is kind of the next phase where on the ecosystem rounds and running the open call rounds is what we really figured out with our community last year. Yes? Alexander, are you only interested in acquiring or are you open to loans also? So us as an organization loaning? Because I think the, the chance for us is that when we acquire pieces, um, we now have to loan them out and, and place them somewhere. Um, so I don't think that's being, it's, it's, it will be a community conversation. I think what I, but what I think could see happen is, is if we really become good at placing these pieces, I could see as part of the organization say, let's start doing and helping other organizations do that. Because I don't know uh, if, how many of you know this, but most museums, because they have limited wall space, are forced to keep most of their collection in storage. So most of the world's art is not on, on display. And that's also what we want to see if we can challenge. I mean, there only is so much wall space in the world, but there is a lot more space than is in museums. I mean, this room, for instance, could, could potentially host art. Um, and that's the case of a lot of rooms. Um, again, some pieces need more protection, but some pieces could, could go here. Um, and again, that's like for us to really get to a point where we can flex that muscle, like, uh, yeah, could see us work with other institutions to help them do the same. Um, because it, as long as it fits within the broader goal, and it, this definitely, definitely would. Yes? product and the business itself, but you say the word community, and I want to understand better, like, do you call the community the people who own the pieces that you're going to acquire, and also um, this community uh, will have to do something with the value of the pieces, it's like, are it possible to combine the community and also the experts or putting the value into the pieces, because that will be, like, also, I changing in the art concept that just the experts are the ones who put the values on the piece so if actually this community can participate it will be something revolutionary I think. That's that's the goal. Um, we look at it as we have three pillars um, on like on the foundation part of the company. The one is to engage and collaborate with the communities to curate um, a collection. The second is to place this all around the world um, the second part of the decentralization so to speak and the third is ownership. It's like also make sure everyone can own it. But as with everything, um, it's very difficult for us to do all at once. Most crypto or Web3 projects start with ownership first. So they communicate the grand mission, they sell a token, people buy the token, and then try to figure everything out uh, afterwards. And, and I challenge that notion. I think that's exceedingly difficult. Not only because the moment you've introduced financial incentive into the thing, it becomes really hard to navigate and, and make decisions. But second of all, also because of um, legal compliance. So the US is now cracking down pretty hard on 
on a lot of crypto projects. And had we made the decision to, be able to start with ownership, we probably would have been caught up in legal court cases right now. So we decided to say, you know, let's focus on the curation first, the participation, be a little traditional on the ownership front, but push and move towards the point where all members are the owners of the museum. Um, but that's also going to be a tra transitory process. Thank you so much. More questions? I, uh, I think yeah, more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm an artist, <clears throat> yeah. so I can just apply with my thesis, physical, just a professional picture with and apply on to the website, right? And it will be considered if it can go to or... So yeah, you will first apply to be a member, and you come in right now, most of our conversations is with a lot of other uh, companies in the space are happening on Web3, slowly getting our own communication spaces for people to communicate. Um, but we have a, for our artists, we have a pretty engaged artist community here in Lisbon, actually, uh, in our creative works channel, where they share their works, what they've been doing, their methods. We do these artist spotlights, so we have uh, these live conversations with artists on Instagram, where they do a studio walkthrough. So one artist here from the city called Sandro, a French artist who lived in Lisbon for a while, did a studio walkthrough of his, uh, his studio across the bridge. Um, so for him, I think the allure was that, well, he gets to first of all participate in the conversation about the position of the community, but he also gets to talk with the global community of art interested people from Lisbon. Um, so we would highly encourage you to, to join, um, I mean, with the thesis of being a member, then when it comes to proposals, when we have open call rounds, Anyone can propose the works, including their own works. Um, so yeah, in that case, you can propose your works for the acquisition. And then eventually, the more expertise you build and the more reputation you build, I think talent protocol is interesting because this is some of the things we have to solve. You could get to the curatorial committee, and in this case, you have more sway over what makes it into the you know, acquisition round that everyone votes on. Um, but yes, we'd love to have you there and, uh, and share, share your work with the rest of the community. Yes. Um, I would be interested to see uh, how you select members at this point to stay true to your principle of mm -hmm. So, um, we have an education that's primarily there to vet for interest and passion. And I think because when we first launched, uh, we're tangential to the Web3 space. The one thing we wanted to avoid was get a lot of people in who wanted to, to ask us when token, when NFT. Those are the conversations we don't really want to happen in the community because they take away from the conversation about the art and what we're trying to do. So the primary focus of the application is really to vet for interest and passion. Um, but outside of that, we're not particularly restrictive on it. And then the second thing is just making sure that we don't bring in too many at the same time. It becomes really difficult to run a meaningful conversation if you have too many people in the room, especially in Discord. Which is why, again, we're trying to build better tools for facilitating community like conversation with more people. Because in its essence, everyone should be able to participate. And then we need to build the mechanisms that distinguishes between someone who just likes to participate um, like once a few times a month versus someone who's built 15, 10, 20 years of art experience and wants to really engage in, in the meaningful, uh, the more like, necessary uh, components of day-to-day of -day operations. Um, but yeah, those are some of the things we build to solve. But again, most people will <coughs> to come in if they are interested. We might just have to, to bash a little bit. And right now, membership is also free, by the way. And I think for everyone will be further. Um, from a monetization perspective, um, the goal is to, to have that happen on the ownership side. So we bring it in there. But again, if we start, as a lot of uh, communities in the web fee space do, they charge sell an NFT, we also decided against that because those quickly rise up to a value um, where most people can't participate. And then again, you're just re- uh, redoing the existing structures of, of, of the space. So we decided not to do that. More questions? Yes. Okay, two more questions, please. Yeah. Uh, what's your business model? So right now, our business model falls on the um, partly on the fund, so the ownership side of things. So the community and the museum gets a little bit of, of a management fee for the assets that are acquired, which means, unlike most museums that have no deaccession policy, we will have to have some level of deaccession policy. As with most funds, it's rolling, so there is a case for some of the you know, the art pieces we can end up retaining, hopefully, forever uh, or for a very long time. And the cultural artifacts and assets, which are in general in nature also a little more contemporary, we will probably have to deaccession some um, to keep the whole thing running. 
Then there also is a case for, for some memberships. Um, the question is just what do they do? I mean, we don't want to limit membership on the participation side, but we might introduce a paid membership on some of the perks and experience side. So as we place pieces, members get access to other museums or special perks around the world. So akin to what you would pay for any other machine membership, we might charge the same to get access to that, but your voice can be heard uh, without payment. We're still figuring out those components, and again, trying to tread the balance between the run out of money, the whole show can't go on. Um, but if we if we try to overexploit it, we also take away from our mission. So it's a little bit of a tight rope. Um, so it sounds really great and interesting. It also sounds all very consensual and kind of gentle and everything works nicely. But art is quite often challenging and, and confrontational. Like the image behind you is beautiful, it's striking, it's interesting, but it could also be regarded as violent or uh, disturbing, maybe even some culture offensive. And you must come across this issue. I, I think I've, I've, got some, I've got some kind of idea of the, the kind of governance of yours. So your organization is that you put some committees to do selecting procurement or discussions about how you move forward and there's some kind of democratic structure. But there are there are real arguments and discussions in, in art and culture. For example, I, I read my seven year old son Harry Potter books to you know at night to go to bed and he loves them. But some people find that annoying because of the, the prominence of the books or the author J.K. Rowling is very controversial in some ways. How do you have, have you got an example of a, an argument or a dispute that you've managed to have? Uh, absolutely. So um, one of my first landing pages when we first started the thing, I was really married. I really loved the, the, the headline called "Culture's Conversation," um, and for me, it felt so relevant in these days and times because I feel like conversation is breaking down. To me, conversation is not uh, us being able to have a conversation about things we agree on; it's being able to have it about the things we don't. And in politics, we've largely failed at that, especially in the U.S. Um, but I feel like culture is probably the one place we can still do that. We can disagree and we can still talk. Um, and that has happened multiple times in the community. Um, we had an acquisition with uh, Rick Owens and Michelle Lemmy. Um, and they do furniture and design artifacts. And the artifact that actually ended up being acquired was called the Oxbone Chair, which is this beautiful carved chair out of Oxbone. Um, but there's also a decent, a decent amount of vegan members in our community who are very offended by the Oxford, I mean, by, by, the, by the method and what they do, and that, that an animal was meaning lost in the process of making the chair, and, and they made extremely sound and very valid arguments for it. Um, but other members also made arguments for, that you also hear with, um, with Harry Potter, that you separate the art from, from, from the artist. And I'm not one to judge which one is right, but I, what I am arguing is that we need those conversations, and that's really what we invite, that our members have those conversations, that they embrace it. Um, and I think it was interesting to see this. There was people who were sellers in belief, but everyone stayed and engaged in the conversation. I think that's also what we look at. Yes, we acquire art pieces, um, but the pieces don't stand alone. These conversations really contextualize and give meaning to the art. So rather than go against them, I really want to embrace them. Thank you so much.